Ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, we're about to start. Good evening and salam alaikum. Welcome to this keynote lecture. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce tonight's speaker, Ionuț Alexandru Budistianu from Romania, a dear friend of mine. Ionuț is a computer programmer, inventor, entrepreneur, and holds a bachelor degree in computer science from the University of Bucharest. At the age of 19, in 2013, Yonutz received the grand prize of the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair for his low-cost self-driving car prototype. He was nominated by Time Magazine as one of the world's most influential teens. And an asteroid was named after him by MIT Lincoln Laboratory. Yonutz developed his own artificial intelligence programming language and contributed to more than 50 software and electronics projects from an early age. As a founder of startup VisionBot, he recently built himself a manufacturing facility for robots. Nominated by Forbes magazine as top 30 under 30 in Europe, Yonutz was also named an ambassador of Romanian tourism and received awards from IEEE, Yale University, Google, and the European Organization for Nuclear Research in Geneva, to name just a few. A role model for youth from around the world, Yonutz is here with us tonight to share his journey and path to success. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming on stage Yonutz Alexandru Budistianu. Wow. Salam alaikum, everybody. My name is Jans Alexandru Budistanu, and I am a maker. This is my garage from Romania, where I build my electronic projects. I build my stuff. I'm 24 years old, and this is my passion. My passion to use computers and my mind to build stuff. In the past, I've been working to create a self-driving car, the software for self-driving cars, and I have received a $75,000 grant prize from Intel. I founded VisionBot, Pick and Place Machines, in Romania, where we started the small manufacturing facility. And I've been nominated one of the top 10 most influential teams in 2013 by Time Magazine. I'm here to tell you to be passionate about what you like to do. To change the world, you need to be passionate. This is my passion. My passion is to build stuff. And in order to change the world, just play with your passion. This is me in 2008, when I was still working on my passion in my computer science from a laboratory from Romania. And over there, my, my job started. My passion started to build stuff. I am born in a city called Rimniku Vulcea. It is also called Hackerville. Although almost all the neighbors from my city were looking to become hackers, I said, I want to be a computer scientist. And what's funny, when I was like 14 years old, I actually built a small antivirus to detect the viruses of those neighbors. <laughs> it was called Romanian Pisicillin. It was a challenge. It was not a product. But I built it. It was very, very interesting for me, very funny. Because I was challenging myself if I can use my passion to build this software. And actually, it was detecting also some of my viruses, because I was from Hackerview, of course. And this is me in 2006, 2016. In my garage, when I started to manufacture the robots, pick and place machine, vision bot, and I'm still playing with my passion every day. This is what I love to do. In order to change the world, just play with your passion. I'm here to tell you that you need to choose a, a job that you love, and you'll never have to work a day in your life. This was said by Confucius about 2,500 years ago. Probably not in English. But it's very important to choose a job Something to do in your life that you really love it. Don't do something only because somebody told you or your parents told you to do that. Just find what you are good at and just work with your passion. Just work for yourself and to achieve your dreams. That's very important. Just play with your passion to achieve your dreams. This is what I love to do. And I'm going to tell you about some of my projects. One of the most interesting is the self-driving car. Autonomics, 
When I was 17, I wrote the software for self-driving cars to detect traffic lanes, traffic signs, to propose a path for the car to drive. And this is a simulation. It is not the car driving, but it is a simulation how the car was thinking of how to drive over there. I also built a small 3D LiDAR for the self-driving cars because they cannot work only with images. At least in 2013, nobody was thinking about that. And I'm going to show you how I started to do that at the age of 17. I was just challenging myself if I can build something like that. And I was doing just like milestone after milestone, and I was able to do a prototype. And it, I was not looking to sell it. I was just looking to do it for myself because I was learning something. It's very important to learn something from every project you do, from every experience you do. You need to learn something useful for yourself. This is the software I wrote in just one year back then to use the AI, artificial neural networks, multi-layer perceptron, to detect traffic lanes, traffic signs, the, the signs from the street, and so on. And I was just playing with my passion. I wrote the software to detect the, uh, the traffic signs and then to use the GPS to do collaborative uh, communication between the cars. Because I said, you know, every car was recognizing some traffic signs. Let's just make the cars, the cell driving cars, just communicate with them to increase the accuracy. I, just, I got this idea in one morning, and I said, I can do something like that. Let's try it. And it took me, I don't know, one, two months. But it worked. And it was interesting to see if, if it works. I actually only tested with only one machine, with one car, because you know, I didn't manufacture cell driving cars. But the problem of full autonomous cars in 2013, and still it is, it is the expensive 3D LiDAR. It costs $75,000, only a device that is mounted on the car to detect objects. So this is the, uh, this is the 3D light I use for most of the self-driving cars from General Motors, from Google, from Ford, from BMW, and it was $75,000 in 2013. And I couldn't, avoid, I, I couldn't afford to buy that. And I, I didn't even know that they require a such kind of device. And I searched on eBay. I find that it's $75,000, and I said, oh, God, I cannot buy it. Because you know I was just like 17 or something like that. So I did research. I understood how it works, how the laser works, how the avalanche photo detector works, and I built a small $200 prototype. It took me a few months, but I was able to collect data for my project, for my science project. You can see everything was in prototype level. It was not for manufacturing. It was just for me to see if I can build something like that. It was working, and after that, I'm going to show you how I started to do that, how I started to do this project. I mounted a 3D LiDAR on my car. Inside there were like four or five laptops, because I couldn't buy a supercomputer for, for my cell driving car project. Three different cameras, and a driver, my father, because I didn't have driving license. And me, inside, I was collecting the data, and at home, I was training the neural network to see if it was working or not. And how did I start it? Initially, I got this idea from doing an online um, course, AIClass.com, which was made by Udacity uh, with a partnership from Stanford University. And they were describing about how they use artificial intelligence in the Stanley, the self-driving car from Stanford. After that, it was the Google self-driving car. And you know, everything was very theoretical, and I got this challenge. If I can write you know, what the teachers were describing in the, in the course, and I started to, to write a, a small percentage of the, pro, of the project, especially to use biasing and networks to do the, um, the decision of the car, how to change the steering wheel, and so on. And after that, I got another course from the same professor, Sebastian Tran. And uh, I did another course on Udacity. Almost the same stuff, but they forgot, when I started the project, they forgot to tell something, that their self-driving car, the Stanley, is using a $75,000 device. So I started in the project, I wrote most of the project, but I didn't know that it requires that device. So I knew that I have a little bit of experience in electronics. I am a software developer as a background, but I've done a few projects before in, in hardware. So I said in my, in my not in my garage, in my house of parents, uh, I started to say, okay, I can actually, maybe I can build a prototype for that 3D LiDAR. And I started to under, understand how it works. I have researched a lot, of, um, a lot of papers, even the patent behind the Velodyne. And I was trying to understand how, how, how can I build one. 
using the same technology, exactly the same technology, but just made by me or something like that, and very simplified. So I was working, it's very hard to do electronics because you need a lot of equipment, you need a lot of uh, devices, for example, for soldering the components. I was using a microscope, or though it was a prototype, a digital microscope. So it, it is not something easy. But it becomes easier every day you do. That's it. You start to do it, and it becomes easier and easier every day you do it. You just need to do it and to start to doing. And over here, you can see the first time when I've got the first signal from the, my prototype 3D LiDAR was um, the, the signal generator from the avalanche photo detector. I did electronic schematics, although I'm a software developer as a background and computer scientist. And, but I, I learned from YouTube of how to design electronic boards and how to manufacture them in house, in the house. And um, after that, I also did a, a new version of the 3D LiDAR with a partnership from an automotive company from Romania. But we, uh, we didn't go, to, manuf we didn't go to, to manufacturing. Because prototyping hardware, it's something different than manufacturing hardware. It's more complex. So I have done the design, I have done everything the math, but we were not able to manufacture. So the, ma the market is quite hard for automotive markets. Because you know, there are not a lot of self-driving cars on the market. And only big automotive companies can, be, can buy your, 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 your 3D LiDAR. They're also used for cartography. And I wrote the software. Then you know, I said, I can use Doppler effect. I didn't even know how they use it, but the same way, the Doppler effect, in order to calculate the, 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 the speed of the moving objects. You know, the 3D LiDAR is not detecting cars or vehicles. It is just detecting objects. And using Doppler effect, I was able to detect in which direction those objects are moving, with which speed, and so on. And I did a software. I did my first 3D um, OpenGL, first uh, 3D software to render the data because it was hard, hard, hard to represent in 2D. And it was interesting. It, I was doing challenge after challenge. And most interesting is was I didn't know the next challenge. That was the most fun part of, uh, of the project. Because I was just exploring how to build the, the self-driving car project. I tested also on the daylight, also on the night. On the night. And um, yeah, it, it, the technology, now it's obsolete. <laughs> because uh, a lot of things had been changed from 2013 to now. Uh, the, the new research are trying to use deep learning. In 2013, nobody was using deep learning because I think it was not invented then. <laughs> and everybody was just using uh, multi-layer perceptor neural networks and other convolutional neural networks, but not with a lot of layers. And I was just trying to test it to see the accuracy. It was not a great accuracy. But it was a challenge, and I learned a lot. Because I told you I couldn't buy a supercomputer to put in my car, I used five different laptops, and one computer was collecting the data from all those five laptops, and because it was hard to open all of the software from each specific laptop and so on, and I did a lot of master centralized software to control all of the other laptops. And um, that's the story with the self-driving car. And then I got the new challenge. I was looking to manufacture the 3D LiDAR. But the problem was, in order to manufacture, you either go to Chinese manufacturers or you manufacture by yourself. And I was not able to, um, to manufacture the 3D LiDAR. Like me, there are about 7.5 million makers who make prototypes, electronic prototypes, like my 3D LiDAR. But they are lacking the technology to manufacture those 3D LiDARs in great amounts. So um, in order to manufacture, you pretty much you need machines. For example, this is the Apple One prototype. It's not the original prototype because nobody knows, but this looks like something like that. And this is the Apple One product. The difference, a few million dollars. Because they had uh, factories in Silicon Valley that were manufacturing in great numbers of products. The, the technological difference, almost zero. But to manufacture in great numbers, it's a huge problem to solve because you need expensive machines, you need engineers. Now it, it becomes more, more complex uh, because the technology in electronics becomes more complex and so on. And it's very difficult to do. Usually, you, you, you go to work with the Chinese manufacturers. But when I sent the schematics to a Chinese manufacturer, he told me that I need about 50,000 3D LiDARs to manufacture mine. And it probably it was like a few million dollars. And I said, no, I cannot do that. And you know, I was thinking, how can I? buy one, or how can I make one? And so I went back to my homemade laboratory, because it was still in my, in my house, but you can see more equipment over there. <laughs> and um, 
I designed a vision bot, which is like a pick and place machine for electronics. And I was thinking pretty much to use the technology from 3D printers, because everybody was talking about 3D printers, and to, benefit, to make it to assembly electronics, to make ele assembling electronic boards. And I'm going to tell you how I started the project. So it is pretty much like a 3D printer, but it is picking and placing tiny electronic components onto the circuit board. The, the difference between a 3D printer and the, three, uh, the vision bot is that we use computer vision, especially two cameras, a microscope and a camera, in order to see if the components were picked correctly and they will be placed correctly on the board. So it is a more difficult project problem than a simple 3D printer that everybody is manufacturing. So this is a video of the first, not the first one, but in the first few dozens units we were manufacturing. And you can see the machine is just picking, is using digital microscopes and cameras to understand if they were picked correctly. And the machine is just placing on the correct position onto the circuit board. And how I started? I just started for myself. I made a website, and people called me, sent me emails if I was asking me if I was selling the machine. And it was still a prototype. It was just for me. It was barely working, the first prototype. And I thought there is maybe a business to manufacture those robots in greater amount and uh, start shipping them to customers. And you know, after that, I, I have trying to understand how the pick and place machines work. And I built one even without seeing one in, in face to face. So I built the first 10 pick and place machines, actually a ship pick and place machine to customers without seeing one, one competitors. I mean, I've seen on YouTube, but I didn't see one face to face. And uh, it's interesting that you can see and you can discover the problems or so the manufacturer they had the same uh, by building those kind of uh, machines. And you can see also the challenges of how to manufacture in great numbers, how to ship the product to customers, how to make the customer support. And there are many challenges you need to, uh, to make, uh, to overcome over the time in order to, uh, to manufacture those kind of harder products. OK, so I did a website. OK, let's see how I started. So I was coming back from Shanghai from an um, electronics competition. And I was thinking about my pick and place machine. <laughs> And then I started to buy some mechanics, some aluminum. Over see, what you can see over here in this picture is about $300. So don't imagine my garage is a multi-million dollar <laughs> garage. It's just a very cheap one where we manufacture those robots. And you can see I was iterating. This one were shipped. The, those machines were shipped to customers. And every time we were trying to iterate for us to optimize the manufacturing process in order to make it faster for us to manufacture. Uh, because it was very hard to manufacture because we, 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 couldn't, we, could, we couldn't afford to invest millions of dollars in buying robots that will help us to make a few components, a few mechanical components. So pretty much most of them they were like manually made using machine, machines, but they were not precise. So we had the problem with calibrating each machine to each customer. And the biggest problem is that some customers, they decalibrate the machine and it's very difficult. And you can see over here, when we started to manufacture a few more, and you can see this picture, two pick and place machines, and uh, different concepts, different models. And I was just playing to see if I can manufacture those robots. And you can see over here, five different robots, and so on. And uh, in my garage, now my garage become bigger. <laughs> and you can see uh, that we were trying to make manufacture those robots. If you ask me if it's a great model, business model, maybe it's not, because I'm a software developer, this thing is not scalable. Also, customer support for robots is not scalable, especially for manufacturing robots. And uh, you can see over here a second office. It's still for my parents. The both the locations are for my parents. But you can see there is a second office over here with more robots. And uh, we were just playing with our passion if we can manufacture those, uh, those stuff. Doing hardware, it's hard, because you need um, digital oscilloscopes, signal generators. They are not expensive. For example, what you can see is about $2,000 in this picture. But you still need them. You cannot prototype something without those. I mean, when I did the 3D LiDAR, I didn't have much. But, uh, but different projects, complex products, and especially products, it's very hard to do them without proper technology, um, especially hardware. While in software, you just need a computer. You need a VPS, a virtual private server. And pretty much, you can deploy a server, a product online, a website, a platform, a blockchain technology, everything you want. You just need the laptop and a VPS, which is like two bucks per month. 
So it is, you, you can achieve many things. So you can see over here, we were manufacturing a few more robots. We were shipping them to customers. And it is a great challenge. But the problem is that you need there's some machinery. This is um, a latte. I am not sure how to say it in English. Uh, in order to, uh, you know, to cut very precisely some components, uh, milling. But you can see there are machinery and very hard to transport them. I presented in Silicon Valley the concept, the product. Nobody was interested in, uh, in harder products and so on, especially manufacturing robots. And um, I got the gold medal, but it didn't help me anything uh, in order to, with, with my product. What helped me was the website. Surprisingly, in one year, 31,000 people were interested in those machines. So even a niche product like VisionBot, which is like a affordable pick and place machine for electronics was really on demanding from makers, small, medium enterprises that were doing electronics and so on. And um, yeah, there were like from 180 countries, even from Africa, they were looking to buy those kind of machines. We didn't ship, we shipped only in Europe because it's very hard to ship them abro abroad, especially when you ship something affordable and it's like 60 kilograms product and it's very hard to, to ship them even to uh, to other customers. Most of the customers that asked for us were from India and from Iran, surprisingly, and, but we shipped only to Europe. So why, wh why our customers want our robot? So pretty much they design a prototype. Sometimes it may look something like that on a breadboard, but it doesn't. They use our machine. They manufacture like smartwatches or small products or something like that, but not very complex. And they can manufacture something like this, about 50 smartwatches per hour with our robot. It's not the same speed as a very expensive robot, but you know it's something else. Another project, Save Energy, it's a partnership with a company from Romania, Evonomics. So they uh, they came with this idea: if we they can design a smart socket, because everything is talking about Internet of Things, a smart socket that is collecting data about the um, electricity consumption from the socket, and um, so they they showed dashboard, but they also they. Uh, they, 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 they ask us to, to make an algorithm that is analyzing the electricity consumption um, like using a small AI. And when it's detecting that electronic components, like devices, computers, they turn off. So they are no longer used by anybody. The smart socket is automatically disabling them. It's turning them off. So it is saving, it's called standby energy. It's, uh, it's saving a little bit of energy. It's, it is working mostly for hotels and for, for office buildings because nobody's working after like 6 p.m., 8 p.m. or something like that until in the morning. And you can program the smart socket to turn automatically the devices in the morning. So, you know, you have seen in many hotels there is a small switch on each socket, a turn off, turn on. But it's very hard to be used by a customer because every time you need to switch on and off. So this smart socket is trying to optimize the process and uh, to simplify it. So they designed a prototype. We came with manufacturing and something like that. It's not a very complex product. Uh, we, are still, um, uh, we are still in negotiation for shipping the product to different customers. Uh, but you know, somebody came with an idea. After that, there's been some prototyping. After that, you need to optimize the prototyping for a product. And then you send it to a customer, and you try to find more customers for that product and so on. So it's very important to just have an idea but after that, you will be the person who's going to make that idea happen. Not, but not somebody else. You need to do it. Another project I only started recently, it's a cryptocurrency. It's called WebDollar. We have a testnet on webdollar.io. It's a currency of the internet. You know, everybody is talking about Bitcoin, but actually only a few of them actually use it. I have a question for you. How many of you actually use Bitcoin for paying a product or a service online? Raise your hands. Wow. I think nobody. <laughs> I'm not sure. Maybe one, two guys from the entire auditorium. The reality is that Bitcoin has a mass adoption problem. Only 0.04% of the people actually use Bitcoin in reality. Because everybody's talking about Bitcoin, but this is Bitcoin in reality. It's a terminal software that you have to download to install it, and it takes 140 gigas of data in order to mine the Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin was a 2008 prototype. It was not a product, it was not something you know, a company built it. It was an open source project, and it was for computer geeks. It was not for 
stock exchange, it was not for investors, it was for geeks, not for investing or for having assets on, on Bitcoin. So when I was working on integrating Bitcoin in a, in a website, like um, paying every product on eBay using Bitcoin, because you cannot pay products on eBay with Bitcoin, I found that it's very hard to integrate Bitcoin in, uh, in websites, especially because uh, you rely on nodes or special nodes, RPCs, which tell you that the transaction was confirmed on the blockchain or not. So pretty much if blockchain.info info, uh, will get hacked, about 100,000 websites that are running Bitcoin transactions will get hacked too. Because Bitcoin is a decentralized system, but most of the websites use it a very centralized one. Because Bitcoin is an inter digital currency, while Web Dollar wants to be an internet currency, to be native to the browser, to be native to the internet. So we came with this idea of using browsers, because everybody has a smartphone in their pocket, and they use Safari Chrome to enter on the internet. And we were thinking, OK, let's, make, um, let's combine with mining pools, because nobody can mine Bitcoin alone. They need to join the mining pool. Let's also increase a little bit the anonymity from Bitcoin. Not much, because unfortunately, technology is very hard to make a zero knowledge technology to work in the browser. And we get the web dollar. We came with this idea in October. I was trying to, you know, to, uh, to convince people and uh, to, if they liked our project, our product. And we came, this is a test net uh, after many, many developers from Romania joined the team to manufacture. And you can see you can mine on the website. The website is making a wallet that is stored in your browser. You don't, you don't need to download anything. And automatically, it is mining in your browser if you want to mine. Here's your balance from what you mine. And you can transfer the, the, the web dollars to a different account. You can, you'll be able to sell, buy, and do transactions online using the webdollar.io without having 50 different wallets on your mobile phone, going to different currency exchanges, having huge fees from the currency exchanges. But most importantly, it is for the internet. It is native to the browsers, so it will be native to the, to the websites in order to you know, to verify transactions and something like that. You can set how, uh, how much processors um, your Bitcoin will use. Uh, if you don't know what's mining, mining is pretty much like verifying transactions. If there are more miners, I mean more computers, miner means a computer. If there are more computers in the network, in the decentralized network, then the security increases. And because you let your computer to mine, to verify transactions, complex formulas, then the system is introducing a few more coins in the system to reward one of those lucky guys. So this is the way, but we want to change it to make it to the browser. So we came with this idea. After two weeks, we found there is another team from Germany that they are doing the same stuff. Uh, and uh, we will see uh, what's going to happen next. So when you enter on the website, you automatically connect with other nodes from the network, uh, from different countries and something like that. And, uh, the technology that powers web dollar couldn't be done three years ago. We are using WebRTC, we are using WebAssembly, and those kind of stuff didn't exist in 2008. Neither the names didn't exist. WebAssembly is a prototype even in beta in the browsers. And it was introduced one year ago. It was just the moment. My guys, this idea of, you know, just going in the blockchain industry, and I came with the idea of making a website with the blockchain, and I found the concept, wait, I can, maybe I can put in the browser, the mining, everything, the transactions, and everything. And I've been working, and I was able to get some results. It is not the final, the final technology we are still needing to work, and uh, we, are, we are working to see what's going to happen next. So one of the advantages of the web dollar is that this wallet is safe, secure in your browser, on your computer. So there is no database, and you don't have to download any software. You just enter on any website that uses the web dollar technology protocol, and your wallet is in your browser attached to that website. It's a peer-to-peer -peer blockchain that works in the browser, and we hope that it will have a mass adoption by decentralizing mining, because uh, people can create their own mining pools. Bitcoin is quite centralized for mining. About four mining farms from China, mining pools, they own 60% of uh, Bitcoin mining. And 95% of mining is, is administrated by the Chinese uh, farms. 
So it is not very good for security because that can make double spending on Bitcoin. It cannot be cracked, but um, double spending can happen on Bitcoin. So by doing, by decentralizing mining, will decentralize also this kind of problem for Bitcoin. And we hope it will gonna be the easiest blockchain integration for web application because it was designed from scratch to be for web applications. It will allow microtransactions and we will introduce a few layers of anonymity better on that Bitcoin because Bitcoin was a prototype. So this is how you can integrate the web dollar in a, in a website, two lines of code. You can do it in just like one minute as a developer. This is an HTML page and you can check the balance. That's impossible to do on Bitcoin, but we are trying to see if we can solve this problem and if the market will accept this kind of, of solution. That's very important to see if also the market will accept this kind of solution. But it's very important to just have an idea and then work to accomplish your idea. Work hard to make it possible. Like when I started for the few first one, two months, I was the only developer working on this. I got a small team, a front-end developer, and we were just working on a proto proto uh, proto protocol, but we found more people interested to help and uh, to grow the community who believes in this vision of making a decentralized blockchain that is native to the browser and it is very light. It's very important to be very light. So after we were thinking, so we got this idea and after that we were thinking what can be used for? Because we didn't know about what can be used for. So it can disrupt many industries like, you know, there are a lot of ads online and mining can replace the ads. Instead of showing pop-ups, okay, you can mine 10% of your CPU for mining. You can monetize users online through mining and not through very annoying pop-ups because it is, it is very known that if the website is free, then you are the product, right? So you will no longer be the product. You will just donate 10% of, the, of, of your electricity or something like that, of your CPU to mine on the website. So you are no longer the product. They no longer sell you something. While you use your, their website, you just pay with your electricity or something like that. You're gonna have a referral system by mining pools. Everybody can create their own mining pool, inviting other people. This will gonna solve the decentralized uh, decentralization of uh, Bitcoin mining. And in-game money rewards. Gamers will no longer have to play video games, pay for the video games. They will gonna get paid by the web dollar playing video games because they're gonna mine 10% of their CPU for the, for, for the web dollar or different protocol, and they also pay the developers, but also they pay themselves for playing the video game. So, you know, into, I told you in October, we got, I got this idea. I was thinking about, you know, using WebSockets because I was thinking that you can solve with WebSockets. You can make a WebSocket in the browser. I was making a small white paper. Then I found there is a hackathon in Romania in Bucharest. And I said, okay, I can't join my first hackathon in my life. I didn't go to hackathon, I only went to competitions. So I went over there, take up JS hackathon, it was about JavaScript, I love JavaScript. So I, you know, I described web dollar, everybody was joking about the name, white dollar, white dollar. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I got a few guys who got really inspired by the technology. We, were, we did a small website, we didn't have any website, anything, only some protocol code. And on 1st December, we're able to create the P2P connections, the mini blockchain, and so on. On very close to January, just like one week, two weeks ago, we, uh, we launched the first mainnet, the uh, first uh, testnet for people to test the technology, and we are still improving it. We are still improving it, not somebody else is improving it. So keep in mind, your idea can be achieved only by you or by somebody who gonna, you're going to hire but not by somebody else. You are the people who are gonna make it happen. So we are planning to launch the mainnet, to do some security checks, maybe to bootstrap, uh, not to bootstrap, to boost the, the market cap of the web dollar and something like that. And after that, we'll introduce smart contracts, anonymity, an exchange, also we plan zero knowledge for super anonymity of the, of the web dollar, so don't see even the balances. So we were able to do milestones and something like that. We were just working and everybody from the group was just playing with their passion of coding. Nothing else. No electronics, no hardware, just a simple laptop and GitHub. <laughs> so 
just playing with your passion, download GitHub and something like that. We are still a few guys, not many. We have a group of uh, about 400 people who, you know, likes web dollar. They are super enthusiastic about web dollar and something like that. They become actually evangelists of, uh, for the web dollar and something like that. And we, are, we, we just have this vision, this dream, if we can achieve building this. And day after day, we are getting closer to the final stage. I'm not sure if we're going to get to after the final stage, but we are getting closer. That's right. So you can check the testnet, the webdollar.io. You can join the Telegram. And in conclusion, I want to tell you something. I also heard the previous speaker and said something very close. Shoot for the moon. Even if you're going to miss it, going to miss the moon, you're going to land among the stars. It's very important to have big dreams, to, have, to work for something that is big. Maybe you're going to not achieve. Maybe we're going to not achieve the web dollar. But we will get closer next time. Maybe we'll not get We'll be able to make it this month, but maybe we're going to make it tomorrow or second, in the second in February or something like that. So it's very important to shoot for the moon. That's very important. Many times I heard about people saying that, you know, you must be born to be a software developer. You must be born to be a mathematician. I'm not a mathematician. I'm a software developer, and I totally disagree. You are made a software developer. You are made a mathematician. So nobody is born with, out, uh, with extraordinary abilities. You, are, you just become the person you want. And in order to become, just focus on your passion. Just work. Work day after day to fulfill your passion. It doesn't matter. Even five minutes every day, you can improve yourself. And after a few weeks, you're going to like to work 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, you're gonna, after a few months, you're going to want to work 30 minutes, and so on. It's very important to just want to work to fulfill your dreams. Nobody's born software developer. If I was born like, I don't know, like 100 years ago, maybe I was a soldier on the World War I from Romania, sent from Romania. Maybe I was from a different country. I don't know. If I was like 500 years ago, maybe I was also, I don't know, a farmer in Romania. Because most of the people were farmers back then. Not a software developer, definitely. <laughs> so it's very important to find your passion and stick with your passion. Play with your passion every day. So to tell you how I started, so I got very lucky when I was like three years old. That's 1995, something like that. I got a computer. <laughs> I was like one of the first uh, kids from my neighborhood who got the computer. The story is quite funny. My parents didn't buy it. They received it from like a family friend who got borrowed by my parents, and he couldn't uh, pay it back, so he gave him like uh, a computer or some, and some products or something like that. So my parents, they said, okay, don't sell, let's not sell the computer because the computer is the future. That happens just like after a few years after the communist revolution. So I was playing games. I remember Wolf 3D. I, I remember Prince of Persia. Doom 1, of course. Everybody knows Doom 1. And after some period of time, after I follow my passion of staying in front of the computer to play video games, I asked myself, can I build my own video game? So when I was like in third class grade, like, I don't know, like 10 years, I started to do 3D movies, but very bad 3D movies. <laughs> so it was um, 2000, and in that time, it was Lord of the Rings was the most popular sci-fi, um, not sci-fi, with, with special effects and something like that movie. And I was amazed that I had the technology, the 3DS Max from Autodesk, to create my own Lord of the Rings special effects. And I started to do the tutorials because there were video tutorials. They were in English, but no problem. I played many games, so I knew a little bit of English. And I started to create my own video game, well, video games, my own 3D movies, but I didn't like it. Because I saw that you know, it's hard to model, to have that imagination from modeling from a box to get a human, from modeling a box to get a car. I didn't feel that, you know, that kind of meaning for me to, to do 3D movies. So I saw in a games magazine 
that for making video games, there are two kinds of jobs. One that is making the players, the objects, and the, the, uh, the second job is for the people, for the developers, that is coding how the, how the objects are interacting. So I said, maybe it's the second job for me. So in the fourth class grade, one, after one year, I uh, installed a programming language called QBasic. It was in terminal, it was everything blue, but I was not understanding of what I was doing and what I was learning from internet, uh, not from internet, from the, from the books, and what I, was, what, what, what I wanted to achieve, namely my video game. So after one year, my, my teacher said, you know, if you're going to go to competitions, algorithmic competition, you're going to have knowledge to create your own video game. So I follow my passion. I lead my passion to do algorithms. And then I also wrote my first video game in fifth class grade. But since then, I no longer play video games. And I've never been interested to do video games again. So I led my passion, instead of playing video games, to create video games and then to do software and electronics and something like that. You know, people from Romania, probably also in Saudi Arabia, they are saying there are now opportunities. We, there are no opportunities anymore in the country. There are no opportunities and something like that. The truth is that 2 billion jobs are going to disappear by 2030. OK? But 2.2 billion, billion new jobs are going to appear by 2030. There are new jobs that appear every day and every night by some people who create new business models, by some people who create new startups, and something like that. And this is a cloud that they made with jobs that didn't exist 20 years ago. Blogger, bloggers didn't exist 25 years ago. Maybe the slide should be that updated a little bit. But the word blog in English and blogger didn't exist in the definition 30 years ago, because there was no internet. Okay, There were no video bloggers until five years ago, four years ago. Because YouTube was not rewarding users. So there were no video bloggers. There were no Android iOS developers. Because Android and iOS didn't exist 10 years ago. There were no SEO analysts. Because you know, the search engine optimization was not important that back then. There were no Uber drivers. There were no many jobs. Cloud architect. Big data analyst. Those jobs didn't exist 10 years ago. Invent your job. Don't, go, don't, don't search for your job. Make it yours. M invent your own job. The world is changing a lot. Some people don't see it. This is a famous picture from Shanghai. I've seen the city in 2014 or 15. And you can see a major change. Also, in Dubai, you can see major change. But to don't be biased, in Shanghai, you can see a breakthrough. In 1990s, no skyrocket. An Askai rocket. I don't know, in English. So in two, in, after 30 years, 20, 30 years, you can see a lot of construction, a lot of buildings, and you can see a change. So maybe a few million jobs disappear, the farmers from Shanghai and from locals over there, but a few more millions appeared from all of those offices, from all those buildings. There had been new jobs for electrical engineers, for software developers, for the subway, and so on, for many different applications. This is a famous picture I really like to talk about. US was making billions of dollars. Every year, about 80, 90 years ago, cutting the ice from Alaska, ship it to India, to Middle East, and they were making a fortune. Because the refrigerator didn't exist. They were just cutting the ice, ship it to Middle East, to India especially, and they were making money. This worked for 50 years. After that, it got disrupted by the invention of the refrigerator. At the beginning, it didn't work. It was not affordable for every house to have a refrigerator. So there were maybe some companies that bought big refrigerators or something like that and stored um, you know, ice cubes and something like that. But the jobs and the people who you see over here, they got jobless. They got fired because there was no longer need for them. This is another famous picture from US. OK? So this is about, I don't know, 80 years ago. So maybe some of those guys, they still be alive. Maybe. I'm not sure. So there were, this job was called bowling alley pin setter. Because nobody invented the bowling 
pin setter. Somebody invented the first bowling pin setter was not working well. Maybe from six guys, you needed one guy. Okay, because it was not working 100%. But you, didn't, you no longer had need for six guys, for six kids to work in the bowling. So jobs appears and job disappears. This is another famous picture from Vatican. Same people, same, exactly same people in those two pictures. 2005, nobody was using a smartphone because there were no smartphones. There were a little bit of smartphones, but you know, not that famous as iPhone. And in 2013, everybody was using iPhones and tablets. Same people. Those people, all of those guys, they live. And they are us. We are those guys from that picture, from both pictures. Okay? The world is changing. Just be aware that the world is changing and try to change the world. You have the skills. You have the power to change the world. Just want to change it. Make it happen. I don't know how. Just make it happen. It is also very important to change the world at the right momentum. For example, in 2002, Bill Gates introduced the tablet PC. Nobody cared about the tablet PC because it was Windows XP and it's very hard to use. I, I think. I never used that one. In 2010, Steve Jobs introduced the iPad. Everybody, everybody got thrilled about the iPad. And in 2012, when Microsoft introduced the Surface, I think, they, uh, they, they, they were accused that they stole it from iPad. So it's very important also to get the momentum. Yeah, it's, it's a lesson that I learned quite hard. It's very, very important. You have the idea, but the idea doesn't have any value. It's just an idea. Everybody has ideas. OK, I have a lot of ideas. Everybody has ideas. But what makes the difference is the execution of the idea. How you make it. Bill Gates introduced a tablet. OK, it was not great. It, it had Windows XP, it was very hard to use it. It, it was not the right solution. OK, the, I, uh, the um, iPad was better. And that's the reason why a lot of people bought it, not only because of marketing, but also because the technology was better at the right momentum. And after that, you get a success. So my three lessons I have learned was to work hard to achieve your dreams, to try, try, and try again every day and every night, and try to connect with other people. Tell them what you are working in that try, try, try in every day, every day and every night, and connect telling them what you are working. And what means execution? This is my office from Bucharest, from my second office, where I'm working almost every day. Now I cannot work, but I work on my laptop. <laughs> it's a little bit hard, but this is what means execution. Because if you don't have a lot of employees, in order to achieve your dreams, you are. Your team needs to execute to make that idea happen. So it's very, very important to make you, your ideas working. Also, I truly believe in Malcolm Gladwell idea. It is about 10,000 hours to, to get perfection. Maybe for some people it works to 9,000 hours, maybe to others 12,000 hours, maybe to me 15,000 hours to get to perfection, I don't know. But you need to work a lot to become, to achieve perfection and to become very skillful. Nobody, as I told before, nobody is born software developer. After 10,000 hours of experience, you can get an idea of what means software development. Okay? So it's very, very important to spend a lot of time in products. They don't appear over the night. And in order to change the world, surprisingly, you need to be that guy. <laughs> Maybe, you know, it's hard. We, uh, at, the first, at the beginning, we need to learn from the mentors. But in order to to change the world, you need to be that hardworking, that, like that professor over there. OK? So it is very important to work hard and work hard to achieve your dreams at the beginning, if, unless you go to a corporation. OK? And in order to end, if you don't build your dreams, someone will hire you to build their dreams. OK? That means a job. As I said before, try to invent your job. Try to create your own job. I'm trying to create my own job. Not sure if I am successful or not doing that, but I'm trying, at least I'm trying to do my own job.
upgrade my own job. And follow your passion. Live your dream. Make it happen. And this is my dream. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> if you have questions, Okay, if you have questions, raise your hands. There was a box over here, but it disappeared. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Check. Yeah. Great. Hi. Um, I'd be curious to like know your stance on the current cryptocurrency situation, like the past two days, and how you think that'll affect the web dollar. Yeah, so <coughs> it's a very interesting question. Every, every few years, there is a correction of the market. Earth Strain 2013 has been a correction of the market. Our, I also predicted the correction of the market. I was expecting this to be in the late December. But Earth Strain 2013 it happened after December, namely in January and February. So this is the market itself. It's an organic market. And always happen like that. So it is something that it, it, it needs to be done to the market, I believe. Uh, I was, yeah, as I told, I was hoping in December to, to, be, to, 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 to be something like that. It happened a little bit, but it was, I was thinking to, to happen as this pr proportion in December. And w if, it, if it, um, it changes the concept of web dollar, we're actually trying to change a little bit of the problems of Bitcoin. Like Bitcoin is, using, uh, is based on scarcity, and I'm try we are trying, but still we, don't, uh, we, we were not able to figure out the best solution to create a control inflation to avoid skyrocketing prices and something like that. And very expensive fees. In December, it was like $60 a fee for transaction. OK, next question. Here. Great. Uh, uh, how, how can you balance between your interests in technology and business? Yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, I don't consider myself a business guy. I, I'm just a computer geek, an introverted guy, really. I'm not an extroverted guy. I've only talked to many times. And I'm just trying to, you know, to be myself, to stay in the front of the computer and to spend as much time as I can to be on the computer, not you know, meeting business guys or something like that. I'm just trying to be myself, to live my dream. This is my dream. So I'm just trying to, you know, to, to, to achieve whatever I want. Great. Other questions over there? Wow, almost, almost. <laughs> wow. Excellent. Thank you for your speech. And uh, I have several questions, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, what's the standard of your web dollar? For example, long years ago, the USD dollar is the gold standard. So do you have think of the standard of your web dollar? Uh, the standard? Yes. OK, so we want to be used on online, because everything yes. is happening online. And unfortunately, Bitcoin was not designed in 2008 for online. It's an internet protocol, but it's not the internet protocol for the web. So we are trying to, at least our vision is to become something, to make the web dollar a standard for the web, and to be super easy to be integrated in web applications. Yeah, it's a good idea. but. Uh, for example, you said uh, because of Bitcoin has only few people use this for trade stuff, and uh, how you want to think like uh, advertise your web dollar and also how to let people use this to trade things and also uh, what's the value of your web dollar? Like for example, one web dollar stand for uh, how many, how much US dollars? Like that. okay, yeah. So you ask a few questions. Uh, the, the, the second question is about the value. So at the moment, it's not lunch. So the entire web dollar is zero <laughs> because it is not lunch. We are planning maybe for, for February to launch the web dollar for the public, for everybody to, uh, to mine and everything to happen. And um, if I understood the first question, uh, it was about um, uh, how we make a mass adoption or something like that. Uh, we are hoping for mass adoption for people by simplicity. If you make the cryptocurrency super simple to be used from every mobile phone, from any device, from every tablet, without installing any app or without downloading 140 gigas of data for mining, then it, 
many people were going to abuse it. So this is what we believe, and also we want to lower the fees. We want to impose maximum fees, and by decentralizing mining, um, automatically the fees will be small, uh, lower that on Bitcoin. Like I told you, this December was like $60 fee, which was not good. Okay. Uh, would you and uh, could this uh, web dollar be supervised by government? Super wide or? Supervised by government. Oh, okay. Yes. So because it's a decentralized system, we don't want to be, um, you know, supervised or something like that by government. Actually, we are developing a protocol. So we are not developing a, a company. Like, you know, like most of the ICO companies, they go to Gibraltar or to very strange countries to register over there as companies. We try to avoid this kind of stuff because we are developing a protocol, a technology like Bitcoin. Bitcoin is not a company. So we, we don't want to get regulated or something like that because we make a, a, a protocol. We just write lines of code. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Next questions. I think you need a mic. Very, very nice presentation. I have a question about web dollar, which yeah. is to be the most interesting. <laughs> uh, so uh, one of the main reasons cryptocurrency exists is basically to create a cashless society. That's one of the main goals of every one of them. Uh, yeah. But oftentimes, this is lost uh, when you take into account a change. Because oftentimes, you cannot use cryptocurrency if you don't exchange, for example, dollars into cryptocurrency. Yeah. How do you plan to solve this issue to make it widespread? Yeah, so uh, the biggest problem, yeah, as I've seen, it was the currency exchange, uh, because there are so many regulations for currency exchanges and something like that. And um, the problem with currency exchanges is that there are so many, I don't know, Russians, Romanians, that they get a lot of credit cards, and they, uh, they just convert the credit cards to uh, cryptocurrencies. So all of those exchanges, they need to have some security checks for... For, for, for your account before trading or something like that. Uh, you can, um, what we want to achieve is that instead of making accounts to different websites, you don't need an any account for tr uh, trading web dollars each other. Uh, you don't need any software for, to download to trade web dollars. You, create, you can create your own asset um, uh, in JavaScript or something like that, uh, your own coin. And um, we also want to, to make a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer exchange. Uh, your problem was about currency exchanges, right? It's a huge problem. Currency exchanges are regulated. But peer-to-peers, humans between humans, exchanges are totally decentralized. Like, for example, you know, if you go online, if you enter on the US websites, you cannot pay with, your, with Saudi bank transfers or something like that. But there are maybe a lot of Saudis who will be able to accept bank transfers or the Saudi currency or something like that, or even goods for paying for that, uh, for that web dollar. So we want to build us a peer-to-peer so -peer, uh, currency exchange and not necessarily a centralized currency exchange. Do you get my point? Yeah, but uh, one question also that I have is, how do you then go from your dollars to your pocket? Because, for example, if you have a job and you make, let's say, $1,000, how do you take those thousand dollars and make it into web dollars without any supervision of the government? Because if you don't take a change out of the picture, you still have uh, supervision of the government because they can force a companies be, uh, before that change mm -hmm. to identify who you are. Exactly. So this is what I was talking about, the peer-to-peer -peer exchange. When you do peer-to-peer -peer exchange, you do between two humans. Okay, it can be even cash. Somebody can accept cash, and the other person gonna give you uh, web dollars. And in order to work, to make that happen, uh, the system must accept escrow, escrow as a payment solution, uh, because somebody gonna send you the web dollars. You can see that the person had the web dollars, but after that, the, the you need to pay that guy in whatever currency you want, in in cash, in in goods, in products, or you know you can pay. You give him a car and gonna give you web dollars, and. In case there is a dispute between those two people, a random person will uh, be able to dispute the, if there has been a problem and somebody is not uh, doing something right. So in order to avoid this kind of stuff, we will enable peer-to-peer -peer exchanges that are native to the browser. But what's more interesting is that every website that is integrating the web, web dollar protocol, we have all of those features included in just one line of code. The peer-to-peer -peer exchange, the, the exchange to buy and uh, and sell web dollars through using the credit card, 
and um, mining in a browser with just one line of code. Okay. Thank you. You are welcome. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah, great. Uh, who supported you like financially to, to buy the equipments and all the electronics and all of that? M my second question, why you're not a billionaire yet? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so first question, who supported me? So the first, uh, I got some money from competitions. I went a lot of competitions. And uh, so some of those money was, I used some of those, uh, some of this money in order to buy the first equipment. You have seen that my first uh, picture from my, from my cows didn't have a lot of equipment. So it was mostly from my money, from the competitions I got. But also maybe my parents supported me to buy a few uh, equipment. So, but it was not very expensive. And uh, why I'm not a billionaire, I'm not sure why. <laughs> so yeah, last, last year in February, I graduated college, so maybe this is the problem. <laughs> but I'm trying my best. I will see. I will, we will see. Maybe in five years, maybe in 20 years. It's very important to get the momentum, the idea, and execution. If you get only the execution, you still not get. <laughs> Next question. Great. I guess uh, thank you for the very motivational talk. Um, my question is a bit about, uh, it seems like, F, like you, you make a lot of very complex systems in a very short period of time. How do you not get stuck and what, what do you do, like, what do you do to overcome it? Uh, to overcome what? So when you face an obstacle in building oh, okay. one of your systems, it, it seems like you, you don't seem to get stuck when trying to make it. Like you build things yeah. in like two weeks. And how? Yeah, so, you know, there is a website called Google. <laughs> and I type my problem, like, I don't know why the Node.js is not working, and <laughs> some people answer that question. If not, I'm going to ask some other people. Like, for example, now uh, we, in WebDAR, we use um, a breakthrough mathematical module called uh, Proofs of Proof of Work, Non-Interactive Proofs of Proof of Work. And we, we studied the papers the, because they were published in some uh, universities, in Illinois, of University of Illinois. And I was trying to understand. I got 95% of the code, but I was not understanding uh, about two equations. I sent an email to the authors. One was a typo. That's why I didn't get the equation. And the second one, we were right about a specific uh, equation. So it is very important to, you know, to try to solve any obstacle you have. And if you're not, you are not able to solve it by yourself, try to send emails. Try to use Google. Try to use Stack Overflow. Uh, you know, it was taken over a lot of people who knows even better than me. A lot of fields, all of those fields. There are better en electrical engineers. There are better software developers than me. So try to, you know, to overcome every obstacle you have. Maybe not in one day. Maybe going to take you three days. Maybe going to take you five days. But you will be able to overcome. There is no problem that you will not be able to overcome. Great question. Next question. Hello. So thank you very much for your um, interesting talk. Hey, I'm here. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I can see that you have mastered so many things from the self-driving car, neural networks, uh, manufacturing, electrical device, and now to cryptocurrencies in such a not so long time. So what are your keys to master your, those technology in a very short time? To, to, to get a prototype or to get something that can show to other people to, 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 to uh, let's say, to advertise it. And do you think that you should uh, just focus on one thing to make it a next big thing uh, instead of like, uh, working yeah. on some prototype and then move on with another technology? Yeah, thank Gr you. Great questions. So the first question is how did I get quickly to build all those stuff? I'm 24, so it didn't get me too quickly to build all those stuff. And um, how I do it? I just push many commits on GitHub. That's the way I do it. <laughs> just pushing codes and you know refactoring a lot of code, deleting previous old code, but creating new code. Just pushing commits on GitHub, and that's the way. Uh, that's the way I am able to uh, build all of those stuff uh, by myself. The, the, the thing is that, you know, Malcolm Gladwell idea with the 10,000 of hours to become an ex, uh, a professional. But the thing is that it, it, as you get more experience, it gets easier day after day, you know? Uh, you cannot compare somebody who, you know, just got the computer, installed Node.js with somebody who has, like, 
10 years of experience in C, C++, or I don't know, another programming language. For the guy who's going to get a lot of programming language, who will know better Node.js than somebody who just installed Node.js. Definitely. So if you become an expert, then it, it, it becomes easier for you to understand problems. But it is not easy even for me. For example, I, I was not a web developer. I did only desktop, hardware, electronics. And about one and a half years ago, I started web. Although everybody, I was going to a lot of competitions and everybody was doing web, I was the only guy with software, hardware, and so on. And um, I found it difficult. I started with PHP, of course, like everybody else. Then I found Node.js, and I was like, wow. <laughs> and if, I found it very hard. Like, I installed Angular, and was like a pain in the ass Angular. Then I found React, then I found Vue.js, which I got in love with Vue.js. So that's the way you do it. You're just building your stuff and um, just pushing a lot of commits online on GitHub. You know, just building your stuff. I don't remember the second question. Sorry. Yeah, so my second question was, uh, do you think that you should only focus on one oh, thing yeah. Yeah. to make it the next big thing yeah. instead of moving uh, from thing to things? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, most of my, my projects, um, products, were mostly for uh, challenges for me. Well, some of them, were, I was not really interested to, be, to make a business of them. I got some of them to get a business or something like that, but I found different kind of obstacles, like um, scalability. It's super hard to scale hardware manufacturing, especially when you don't want to pay to buy to, $2 million equipment, machinery, and so on to automatize the manufacturing process and so on. So, um, yeah, so I was trying to get more experience until now, and now I'm trying to get more focused on whatever I want. Um, and, you know, also sometimes maybe if you, you make the best product, maybe you make the best marketing possible, but maybe if it's not the right momentum, you also need to understand. Uh, to you know, to get yourself exit from that stuff and to move to, to the new thing, but it's very important to get the experience. Okay, so don't try to make your first prototype and first uh, project to be interested or so to sell it. It's very important to understand how to do it because if you know how to build one stuff, then you can do something better next time, easier, and something that can be sold better. Okay, so it is not necessary to go straight to the selling point with your first project or with your second project. OK, next question. OK, go ahead. Thank you for the inspirational and very energetic talk. <laughs> uh, coming back to the web dollar and the general story about cryptocurrencies now, you said that you want to avoid uh, the prices of skyrocketing. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as I understand, basically, when you start up a uh, cryptocurrency, the value of the cryptocurrency will rise given the, the amount of, of users it will have yep. over time and real money uh, being translated into cryptocurrencies. So how can you avoid this if there's more users happening? And it seems like the cryptocurrencies is a project which has kind of a, a limited living time where it will reach, where yep. the prices will skyrocket. Yeah, so good question. We are still debating. This is why I, did, I said we didn't find yet a solution. There were three different proposals. My first proposal was um, to create this controlled inflation based on how many miners there are. Because if there are more miners, that means it, is, it became more popular, more, more used. But everybody doesn't like inflation. <laughs> so uh, we no longer go with the first idea. And absolutely nobody likes inflation because that means a smaller price, a smaller um, growth. The second uh, model was to use the Ripple model, Ripple style, to introduce a lot of coins. Uh, that means even after five years, the price will be quite small, maybe a few bucks or something like that, five bucks, ten bucks. And uh, the, the third option we are still thinking is to, you know, to allow miners for five years, ten years to mine web dollar one, and after that to mine the web dollar second, which has a, a more, uh, more coin supply. So there will be uh, an inflation, but on a separate coin, on a token, on a special token, only for miners. But we still we don't choose the third option. We are still thinking. Thank you. You're welcome. It's like you know banks when they issue new currency, like with three zeros, with six zeros, or something like that. But we don't. We want to avoid that the previous tokens to don't be alterated. 
enterprise. Go ahead. Okay, hi. Uh, so I just have a question going back to your first slides. You mentioned that you're a passion-driven person and all what you do is driven from your passion. Yeah. So my question is, what's the source of your passion? What, what's, how do you energize to do all of this? Wolf 3D, <laughs> Wolfenstein. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's how I started. I mean, when I, I got, I, I don't remember the first video game, unfortunately. I think Wolf 3D, Wolfenstein was not the first video game, but it was in the first year, definitely second year. And uh, yeah, I still remember Total Commander, Northern Commander, or what was it called it. So, you know, I got really stuck into the computer stuff, and I really like it. I really like it because you build stuff that you can see it. You can, you know, you can see your currency, you can see your website, you can see your machinery, you can see, you know, people talking about your product, people talking about your idea, and so on. So mostly passion is like an effect of what I'm building in the past. Like, you know, I'm building something new, pa people are gonna talk about that, gonna, you know, make me to spark again with my passion, that, you know, it gets me a new better idea or something like that to do something new or something better, or something more useful to the mankind. So it is like a cycle. It's like a self-feeding cycle. That passion is making something great. That something great is going to make me more passionate about making something that better, or maybe greater, or something like that. I hope I responded to the question. Otherwise, I don't know how the brain was working. <laughs> we'll be taking the last question. Yeah. <laughs> very close, very close. Okay, so actually I have you know, two questions you know, for you. Uh, what would you recommend you know, for a graduate to become an entrepreneur or to get a job? And uh, the second question is, in five years from now on, do you still see yourself in Romania or will you go abroad? Okay, good questions. So initially I was looking to become an university professor uh, because I thought that university professors, they are very close to the edge of the knowledge. You know, every time they research something new, like I told the proof of proof of work was made at uh, the university about blockchain. So, so they do a lot of research. But I got in the same time a little bit disappointed that, uh, at least in Romania, the universities are super theoretical. While, while I can't build really practical software, really practical devices that can be used by people, maybe not successful or not, but there are still something that you can, I can build with my own hands, right? And it gives me more satisfaction building stuff that uh, publishing scientific papers. I also published a few scientific papers before, but it gives me more satisfaction to see, you know, uh, the new technology, to see a new product, to see a new software or something like that, to see well, an update that is fixing bugs. It gives me more satisfaction. And the second question, if um, I recommend, uh, yeah, that one was to, if I recommend the graduates um, to study furthermore, to the graduating, or to, to get a job, I tell you, maybe you study the, in the graduate uh, program, maybe you can create your own job, okay? So maybe from your research, you do like a spin-off, and then you can start from the university your own project, your own startup. You'll find a bunch of, you, you can, you know, ask your classmates with the web dollar. I actually asked one of my uh, high school classmates who went to computer science from a different university. And he liked the idea and said, hey, I can code something over there. And I was super excited. I was super excited that I was able to convince one guy to work with me with the web, web dollar. He liked the concept. He didn't know how Java, the JavaScript. He didn't code in JavaScript at his university. It was a Polytechnica. He studied engineering. He didn't code JavaScript. And he said, OK, I can code JavaScript in one day. Just give me one day, and I can, I can work with you on, uh, on your project. And that's, you know, you need to find a few guys from your classroom, from your class, and just create your own job. It's not necessary to get a job for a corporation, for a company, and something like that. Just try to think, how can I use my mind and my skills to create my own job, to create a company, to create a startup, to create something useful. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for inviting me over here. It was a pleasure. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you for the keynote lecture. Yeah.